Hey, thanks very much, um, <clears throat> Matt and Yasser, for, for that intro. So we've um, covered what is frugal innovation. We've touched a little bit on how do we find frugal innovations. Now we're going to ask the question, well, once you've identified frugal innovations, what do you do about actually diffusing them? And one of the things we want to um, look into a little bit is what are some of the barriers to the diffusion of frugal innovations? In particular, is it or is it not a level playing field? Now, diffusion of innovation anyway is a complicated issue. And one of the things we often complain about is how there's lots of innovation going on, but very little adoption across contexts. So one of the things we want to ask is, to what extent um, are the, some of the barriers to adopting innovations from one country to the next exacerbated, if you like, when we are talking about in diffusion from a very low income context into a very high income context. Um, and we call this reverse innovation, uh, which isn't a particularly good term because it denotes a slightly pejorative sense of, well, innovation ordinarily would go from the high income context to the low income context. It's a historical legacy post-development issue. Um, but it's, it's, the, it's the catchphrase, the, the term that has, has been created. And so when we talk about adopting an innovation from a low-income country into a high-income context, we call it reverse innovation, for want of a better word. And we've already discussed many different examples of frugal innovations. From India, there are others from Brazil, Malawi, from Palestine, Gaza, um, and Peak Vision in Kenya and Botswana. But one of the complicating issues here is how do you actually identify whether the innovation is or isn't from the low-income country? That's one of the issues that you have to start with because, of course, many of the things that are happening in these innovations have been in the zeitgeist already or bits of them have been developed in high-income settings or by people from high-income settings or by organizations that are headquartered in high-income <coughs> settings. And all of these factors may influence the reverse innovation process. It's actually quite hard to identify a frugal innovation or innovation at all that has exclusively been developed by and in people in low-income countries. It's actually quite hard to do that when you get back to the first principles of it. Um, some recent work has been done on trying to create a typology of reverse innovations. And as you can see, depending on whether the concept or its development, the primary market, secondary market, is located in either advanced the A or um, developing the D economies, you can see that there are, there's a spectrum of different types of possible reverse innovations. What we're interested in, because it throws out some particularly interesting issues, is the strong form of reverse innovation. What issue is there, if, if any, to adopting an innovation from a low-income country that's been conceived and developed by and for low-income country settings? So I wanted to just take you through um, some empirical experience that we've had over the last couple of years um, um, before joining IGHI and also as part of a Harkness Fellowship last year in the States, where we um, have developed some understanding around some of the barriers and challenges in this specific space of learning from a low-income setting. Now, we spent some time trying to persuade um, and engage with senior clinicians and decision makers and health system leaders in, in the North Wales context regarding a possible adoption of the Brazilian family health strategy, which I'll describe in a moment. Um, and the reason for that is because in the interface between the primary care clinics in North Wales and the household, as is the case throughout the UK, if you like, there's a plethora of different health professionals delivering different bits of healthcare, whether it's to do with pregnancy or antenatal care or postnatal care or children or adult and social care, mental health, third sector organisations, just in the North Wales context, we identified a, a wide array of different health professionals, all operating in the same geographical space, but in different areas, and of course in a very fragmented and not particularly well articulated way. One of the problems that we see throughout the NHS, I would say. Now, I've got quite a lot of experience having worked in Brazil as a primary care clinician myself in the, in the primary care system there. And they organize their primary care in a very different way. It's um, based around very small teams of just a GP, a nurse, and community health workers. And the community health workers, if you can picture it, are allocated to very small micro areas of about 100 to 150 households each where they live 
They also live in those micro areas. And the community health workers will visit every single month, every household in their micro area and be responsible for that area. And upon each visit, deliver a wide array of cradle to grave health promotion primary care interventions, you know, from pregnancy all the way through to care of the elderly, including immunizations and breastfeeding and <laughs> screening and so on and so forth. So it's a much more, if you like, comprehensive use and, and efficient use of their resources because they are tessellating a very simple model um, at scale. Now, the use of community health workers per se is not new. Barefoot doctors have been around, starting in China, and they're all over America, all over the UK. But what is new about this model is this very efficient, dare I say frugal, um, way of articulating the resources of community health workers in this, in this very coordinated and scalable manner. So we consider there to be good reason to uh, be able to persuade colleagues, public health doctors and other clinicians as to the potential benefits of this particular model. Now, there are lots of reasons why transposing a model like this into the NHS is complicated. You know, task shifting, regulation, issues of financing, the fact that it's a very crowded landscape already. All of those problems are very valid and important, and to some extent we were able to discuss them during this journey. But what we weren't expecting was some quite interesting reactions to the, essentially the idea of learning from Brazil, which is an emerging economy, a middle-income country. What could we possibly learn from a country like Brazil? Does Brazil even have a health system? Well, it would work in Brazil, wouldn't it? Because they're much more friendly and community focused. Now, needless to say, these are sweeping generalizations. Um, but it le led to, we found, and of course this is anecdotal, but we, it led to a number of non sequiturs, which just to our mind was not making sense. They would justify not doing a pilot project because there was no evidence that a pilot project would work, which when you think about it, that's the point of a pilot project. Um, and then other ones like, well, if it worked, we wouldn't be able to afford it, which suggests that, well, let's just stick to doing the things that aren't working. So, and other things like, well, we could do it, but let's just focus on diabetes only, community health workers focusing on diabetes, which of course misses the entire point of the model. Yeah. So what we found was there was some sort of these reactions, if you like, to the idea of learning from Brazil, perhaps in a surprising context to learn from, that got in the way. Okay. Now that's not entirely surprising when you think about it, and if we were to consider this product, this watch for example, consider whether you th how well you think this might work, how much you might pay for it, wh what kind of shop you might find it in, um, how reliable it might be. And then consider this watch and ask yourself, well, has anything changed? And no disrespect to Rwanda, but what this is saying and the consumer literature and the marketing literature and those that have been studying this issue for many, many, many years is that the source of a product, the country in which it is made, actually leads to about 30% of your view of it. So if you do not buy into the idea of a Rwandan watch, you won't view the watch particularly well, even if it might be the same product. The source matters. So what we wanted to do was to explore, well, to what extent does source matter in this reverse innovation process? So we started off by doing some empirical work, some qualitative work, asking health systems leaders in the US, about a dozen or so, but all from different contexts, leaders that have actually been attempting reverse innovation process. So these are innovation thought leaders, senior managers of health systems and academics that have actually been engaging in this sharing of cross-national learning and ask them, well, what have been their experiences? And some of the things we found were the following. Well, they hear Africa and they think that they can't be any good services. Okay, so a sweeping generalization. But then some of it is based in this perceived context similarity. Rightly or wrongly, they would say, well, Canadians look more similar to the US Many more Americans have been. The visuals are more similar, more relatable. So there's a likeness that makes people more willing to see that it, an innovation or a piece of research, could be applicable in the US. So there's the sense of perceived context similarity that plays out in practice. Well, we wanted to quantify the problem. To what extent does, and, the, and here we use the case of research interpretation, to what extent does this issue play out in practice empirically. So what we did was we surveyed every single 
assistant associate and full professor of public health in every single CEPH accredited school or program of public health in every single state in America. We created a list of about 10,000 of them. We essentially created two versions of the same survey, okay, to randomly allocate to this panel. The first, the survey essentially was consisted of four research abstracts that had been identified from Cochrane Review, so already vetted for internal validity and so on and, and source of bias within the, deliver, the, the actual contents of the research. But we changed the source, we fictionalised the source to either a high income institution and setting or a low income institution and setting. Okay? And we randomised those two surveys to the panel. The group, two groups were broadly the same because the randomization was successful. We had about 450 or so in each group. We asked them two questions at the end of each, for them to read each abstract and asked them two questions at the end of each abstract. To what extent do they think the evidence, the, the, to what extent do they think the evidence in the abstract is strong? And how likely would they be to refer a peer to this particular piece of work? So these are two separate concepts, strength of the evidence and relevance, if you like, to them as an individual. And what we were expecting to find was that the source, the abstracts with a low income source may be rated worse, if you like. That was our expectation. We actually found that for the strength of the evidence question, there was, we couldn't find difference between the two groups, which is encouraging. So they were reviewing the evidence within the abstracts on its own merits. So it wasn't being influenced by the source, but when it came to referral to a peer, we found that for one of the four abstracts that there was a difference. The same abstract, all things being equal apart from the source, if it was a high income source, they were much more likely to refer it to a peer, even though it's the same research. So here we have a sort of a benchmark, if you like, a starting point for to be able to identify, well, to what extent does source matter in practice? Um, but it doesn't tell us very much about the reasons why they may be viewing the research differently. So we did a different piece of work, drawing on some of the cognitive psychology, social psychology literature. And some of you may be familiar with implicit association tests. These are those tests that tell you if you're prejudiced or not. Uh, done online, you press buttons as quickly as you can, see if you can allocate stimuli to certain categories. And essentially how it works is you have, in this case, we use two categories, either rich or poor countries and good or bad research. And what you'd, how it works is, it's a couple of screenshots, is you have these two categories put together, in this case on this side, good research in poor countries, and on the other side, bad research in rich countries. And stimuli, these words, will come up on the screen. You have to allocate them as quickly as you can by pressing keys on the computer. Where is it going to go, left side or the right side? So if in this case, worthless would go to the right side under bad research. Okay? The idea is, the longer you take, to the relative latency, it's called, between allocating to one side or the other when the categories are, in your mind, incongruous. That is to say, good research goes with poor countries, may to you seem incongruous, rather than the other way around. In the other screenshot, good research in rich countries, where we swap the categories. If the relative latency shows that you take longer to allocate the stimuli when the when the categories are incongruous, then that suggests you may have what's called an implicit association, that those two categories don't go together. Essentially how it works, therefore, is you calculate what's called your implicit association test score, which across our sample of respondents, about three or 400 respondents, shows that because it's skewed to the right, positive scores, what's this sh what this is showing is that people, on average, consider good research to come from rich countries and poor research to come from bad, uh, sorry, bad research to come from poor countries. Now, the mean IAT score across our population was 0.56, which whilst you can't directly compare to different IAT studies that use similar positive and negative valences, is of a similar order to things that you would be perhaps familiar with in terms of broader societal trends, such as whether a male or female gender is associated or not associated with career or having a family. So similar sort of order. Now, this wasn't the same population that did the abstract survey, but it, tends, it leads us to consider that maybe if these implicit associations are playing out in practice, it can interfere in how we um, review evidence, which of course underpins the value of innovation. 
But it's a complex issue, because if I say to you the word Brazil, some of you might be thinking along these lines, and some of you might be thinking along these lines. And within each of you, you may oscillate between the two, or there may be a blend. So it's a very complex thing. We spend a lot of time looking at the validity of research and how it's conducted, but very little time asking ourselves, as imperfect human beings, what anchors do we attach ourselves to to be able to give research evidence a voice? What are the things that we latch on to to determine whether things are or aren't of value? Um, and I think it's a little bit of a pervasive issue. So when we talk about whether or not this is or isn't a level playing field, we have to ask ourselves, to what extent is this playing out in practice? It may be obvious in the sense of um, an innovation coming from a context you don't think is appropriate for your own, or insidious. So here's a recent article from the New England Journal just a couple of weeks ago who's, that looked at the use of basically mosquito net mesh for hernia repair instead of spending a thousand pounds on a sterile commercial mesh and found that the outcomes were identical. But their conclusion is these results support the use of low-cost mesh hernia repair in resource-scarce settings. But I would ask, well, why? Why, as Matt and Yasser have done as well, why only in resource-scarce settings? Why not also in high-income settings? So just some takeaways. Um, it seems to us that in terms of whether or not the diffusion of innovation is a level playing field, it probably isn't. But more work needs to be done, certainly to look at whether or not people, how people understand different contexts, what's going on in their minds when they think of one context compared to another. More work needs to be done on what this pro-rich implicit association with research. Um, I would say that explicit biases may be subtle. Um, particularly when we fell from our abstract survey, but that scale may be potentially important. So although we only found one of the four abstracts to have a demonstrable influence by, of source, that was 25% of the abstracts that we included in our survey. Think about how much research is being consumed on a daily basis. That was 25% in just this one empirical study. So this could potentially be of importance at scale. But certainly more research need, need, is needed to explore whether that issue interferes with the diffusion process in practice. Thanks very much.